Thank you. I am thrilled to be back at NASIS. This is my favorite place to be this time of the year, other than out in the forest hunting mushrooms. So be doing that this weekend, hopefully. Um, yes, my name is Dan Coe. I'm the graphics editor at the Washington Geological Survey. So this talk has three different sections. The first one's basically why tsunami mapping is important in the Pacific Northwest. The second is about some of the challenges in creating and mapping tsunami data. And then the third is about some of our recent tsunami map products at the Washington Geological Survey. <clears throat> so why are we mapping tsunami hazards in Washington and Oregon and other parts of the Pacific Northwest? Um, you can see the highlighted part of our mission statement at the survey to promote safety, health, and welfare of residents of Washington. So that is the main goal in why we're doing that. Um, and our goal is to provide the information needed to enable risk reduction for the public. So education and awareness of natural hazards such as tsunamis goes a long way to accomplishing this goal and maps play a very important part in that process. <clears throat> so the next set of slides can be thought of as an introduction to tsunamis in both Oregon and Washington, um, since Joanna will be discussing tsunami mapping in Oregon right after this, so stick around for that. Um, we've really only started to understand and to study tsunami risk in the Pacific Northwest since the late 1980s, so it's a pretty new science. Um, tsunamis in this region can be produced by earthquakes elsewhere, such as in Alaska, or by local faults such as Cascadia or other fault zones in Washington. A local Cascadia-induced tsunami could reach the coast in less than 15 minutes on the outer coast and produce inundation up to 60 feet, which is horrifying. <clears throat> so both Washington and Oregon have many coastal communities within the tsunami inundation zones. Um, over 30,000 30, students in Washington and thousands more in Oregon go to schools that are in the tsunami inundation zones. And summer tourism really greatly um, increases the coastal population in these places. We've got lots of great state parks that are really popular um, in this part of the world. So the big threat in the Pacific Northwest is the Cascadia subduction zone. It's just off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's a large megathrust fault where the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate meets the continental North American plate. Um, and this fault has produced large tsunami inducing earthquakes in the past and definitely will again in the future. These earthquakes are known to go back at least 10,000 years with the average interval between um, them being about 240 years and the average interval between really big quakes like 8.5 and greater being about five to 600 years. Now, we actually know the exact day the last big earthquake on the Cascadia subduction zone happened. Um, January 26, 1700, and the reason we know that date is because there are written records of the tsunami in Japan from when the, the wave went all the way across the Pacific Ocean. That's one of the reasons we know. <clears throat> so this diagram shows the mechanics and, um, of a hypothetical Cascadia subduction zone earthquake and tsunami. So opposing forces of the oceanic and continental plates produce that red lock zone you see up there over time, so that gets locked and great pressure builds up. Um, this zone peri periodically ruptures, releasing energy as an earthquake, which can initiate the tsunami and in turn inundate the coast. <clears throat> There's also a handy record of these tsunamis up and down um, coastal estuaries in the Pacific Northwest. So the lighter colored areas in the sediment that you can see in the, the mud of this estuary are actually records of tsunamis. So these layers contain sand and marine microorganisms that show evidence of when seawater inundated these regions during earthquakes or during tsunamis. And you can see there's the AD 1700 deposit is that thick white line near the top. So one large event that has really big implications for tsunamis in the Pacific Northwest is the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami that occurred in Japan in 2011. Um, the Tohoku event killed over 15,000 people and caused billions of dollars in damage. So why is that important here in the Pacific Northwest? Um, basically because the conditions that created the earthquake and tsunami there are almost a mirror image of what's going on along our coast here. Um, in both cases, the oceanic plate is being subducted underneath the continental plate, um, creating an area with great um, potential for earth large earthquakes. <clears throat> so we've got lots of challenges. How do you map a hypothetical tsunami, right? Um, part of the challenge with that is there's, there's a lot of different um, scenarios, especially in Washington, where we have a lot of different fault zones. So 
The ones that are circled up there are all fault zones that could produce a, a coastal tsunami. Um, the one I'll mainly be talking about today is Cascadia, which is the super scary one up in the corner there. It has lots of bright orangey colors. Um, but Seattle, the Seattle Fault, which basically runs right under the city of Seattle, has produced very large earthquakes in the past. And since it's now under a large city, that could also be very bad. Um, so the next challenge has to do with data. And we all know data tends to improve over time. Um, and we use a lot of elevation and bathymetric data to model tsunamis. So, you know, this makes new data makes um, hazard models more robust and better over time, potentially producing more accurate results. Um, in this image, you can see kind of the difference between a 10 meter DEM switching to um, a DEM produced from LIDAR. And this is particularly important in the flatter areas. This is Aberdeen and Hoquiam, Washington. So the more accurate those low lying areas are, the more um, robust your tsunami model is going to be and the better your data will be. <clears throat> so large earthquakes can also lift the land up or drop the land down. So you have to take that into consideration when making models of tsunamis. Um, this kind of complicates that a bit. So the purple area of this map along the coast is the area that will likely drop in elevation during a tsunami or during a er large earthquake. So another challenge is Washington has a crazy coastline, as you can see here. I'm sure you're all aware we're very close to it right now. Um, Washington has over twice as much coastline as Oregon does, um, over 3,000 miles. Not a competition. <laughs> we're just we're just different. It's okay. <laughs> um, these narrow narrow waterways in the Salish Sea and Puget Sound um, complicates data results where the model resolution exceeds channel width. So if the model resolution is 100 meters wide and the channel is only 50 meters, meters wide, it's not going to squeeze through that little hole. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, it can also make map layout tricky if you're making a static map of this area, depending on where you are. So the last challenge is bureaucracy. Um, at the survey, we work closely with a number of other federal, state, and local partners to plan, produce, and communicate the work that we do. Um, and you can see many of those entities listed here at right, you know, w along with the factors <laughs> that we need to consider um, to work smoothly for success in this work. Much effort needs to be put into these, into these relationships to ensure that we can keep producing maps and information for the public, and also that it reaches the communities that need it the most. All right, now onto the maps. So at the, the Washington Geological Survey, we have three people on our tsunami mapping team that are integral to producing our map products. Um, Karina, our chief hazard geologist, Daniel and Alex are tsunami hazards geologists. Here they are doing sciencey things, <laughs> pointing out some tsunami deposits and some maps. Um, I've learned a great deal about tsunami science from these guys and also how to depict tsunami data in effective ways. My role in this process has been as the cartographer, taking the data and outputs that they produce and translating them into maps. So here are a few of our recent tsunami maps that we've produced at the survey. Um, tsunami inundation or current velocity and speed maps. Evacuation walk time maps, which show the time that it will take to walk out of the inundation zone in several coastal communities. Several interpretive tsunami maps and graphics on our website. And then finally, tsunami simulation videos that show tsunami wave amplitude and, veloc and current velocity. So our inundation and velocity maps are based on a modeled magnitude 9.0 Cascadia induced tsunami. So that's similar to the 1700 event. Um, we have three types of maps in this series, two inundation maps and one current velocity map. And we've produced them for about six coastal regions thus far. Modeling software called GeoClaw and MOST, which stands for Model of Splitting Tsunamis. Both of those are awesome names. Um, were used to produce the initial data, which was then processed into maps using ArcGIS desktop, and then onto Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator for the final products. Here are three maps from Southwest Washington, two of the inundation maps on the left and the current velocity map on the right. Let's zoom into one of those areas. So this is the Westport Peninsula um, in southwestern Washington. Now the map on the left shows binned inundation with yellow showing inundation of zero to two and a half feet, light orange two and a half to six feet, and dark orange, which is most of that map, um, 
showing inundation that's six feet and above, which is, like I said, most of the map. So the center image shows a more detailed, continuous um, inundation raster where spot values are listed for certain areas. Um, so you can get a little more into the nuance of the data. You can see near the center of that map, there's a terrifying inundation of about 53 feet right at Surf Street, appropriately named, I guess. Um, the map on the right shows current speeds with the purple areas being the fastest at nine knots and above. So those current speed maps would be obviously useful for um, mariners, anyone who does any boating, to know where, you know, if you're, if you're out in the ocean, these are the places you probably don't want to be. All right, so that brings us to our evacuation walk time maps. So why walk time maps? Um, and the reason is basically many coastal areas will likely have impassable road networks after a large earthquake due to land liquefaction um, and or structural damage making driving likely impossible in many places. Now these, mo these uh, maps were modeled on a slow walk pace of 2.5 miles per hour which is considered the planned walk speed for crosswalks. Um, and we've mapped about 10 coastal communities so far. In the process, potential areas for vertical evacuation structures have been identified, um, and these pr were produced using ArcGIS desktop, um, an add-in called Pedestrian Evacuation Analyst Toolkit, which was developed by Nate Wood at the USGS. He's kind of a pioneer in this work, and also Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. So here are some of our maps. So this is a walk time map for Port Angeles, Washington, um, on the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Note the areas at the end of the sand spit that say must walk fast and must run. <laughs> Those are areas where model the model tsunami arrives before one can safely walk out of that zone. Um, luckily, or hopefully, um, there, there's actually a Coast Guard base at the, on the end of the spit, so we're trying to work with them to develop a plan for evacuating people on the spit. So these maps range from fairly straightforward inundation um, and routes such as the map on the left in Bellingham where the tsunami won't arrive for over two hours after the earthquake um, to more complicated areas on the right at Cape Disappointment in southwestern, or excuse me, on the left um, at Cape Disappointment where coastal wetlands really complicate evacuation routes and the tsunami wave could arrive in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there are places on many of our maps where there is not enough time to safely evacuate on foot, and this is one of those areas. You can see in the, the bottom corner, it's, it's probably hard to see from where you are, but it says estimated wave arrival time 20 minutes next to a symbol that says it'll take you 45 minutes to walk out. So not a great place to be. Um, so these places are good candidates for vertical evacuation structures. Unfortunately, there's only one of those in all of North America, and it was built in Westport, Washington in 2016. Um, this is at the Acosta School in Westport, and this roof, I've been told, can hold comfortably 1,000 people and uncomfortably 2,000 people. So if you live near there, you're in luck. Um, one, addition, one additional vertical, vertical evacuation structure is currently be, being built in Tokeland, Washington, on the top side of Willapa Bay. Um, Japan has many of these structures and they likely saved thousands of lives during, during the Tohoku tsunami, so you can see the importance of them. So over time we're hoping that our maps will encourage communities to come up with alternate tsunami evacuation options such as these in order to save lives um, if such an event were to happen here. Okay, and I also wanted to mention that our maps aren't created in a vacuum. Um, we also, they're also reviewed, developed, and presented at many public events along the Washington coast. The communities that are mapped generally give input into the mapping process, um, and one of our state emergency managers is also very colorblind, which is great because he provides a good check on our efforts to make these maps as colorblind friendly as possible. Um, so we have a tsunami roadshow annually, lots of stakeholder meetings with communities, and we do tons of presentations upon request for community groups. All right, our tsunami webpage also includes a great deal of information on tsunami science, history, um, and, and other aspects of tsunamis, as well as providing a gateway to our maps and our data. Additional maps and graphics on our tsunami page enriches the experience for the reader and hopefully expands understandings of, understanding of tsunamis in our region. Other maps on our website, such as those used in this comparison of topography and tsunami inundation also provide a good way to convey the threat of a potential tsunami in a way that words alone cannot.
This is also a Cape disappointment. <clears throat> All right, and we also provide an avenue to view and download our tsunami data and publications through our ge geologic information portal where we host much of our information. Now on to our most recent map product, with, which I'm pretty excited about, our tsunami simulation videos. Um, these simulations provide an understanding of tsunami physics, mechanics, and movement that static maps and data do not. The main takeaway from these, at least in my opinion, is that tsunami waves can continue for hours after a large earthquake, and that it's not just a single wave coming in and then it's all done. Um, these videos are also meant to be viewed more than one time and kind of ingested over time. So, they're on the Washington DNR YouTube page as well as our website where you can download the videos directly as well. Um, NetCDF files were produced using modeling software for these. They were then animated in ArcGIS Pro and imported into Adobe After Effects where we added a lot of contextual data to the final videos. We have a lot more on the way too, so we've got nine more probably in the next month that are come, going to come out. Um, and we were pretty happy there was a lot of news coverage about these, so they got about 140,000 views in the first week, so we were happy that people were actually seeing them and, and checking them out. All right, with that said, hopefully, do I have time to show like a minute's worth of video? Cool. I'll come back to this slide here in a minute. So I kind of jumped ahead in one of these videos. Too many windows open, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, so the thing I want to mention is, so dark red in these videos means it's um, a wave peak of 10 feet or more, and dark purple means it's a wave trough of 10 feet or more. And these videos are sped up by about 300 times, so they're much faster than reality. But here we go. Get ready, here it comes. The really scary part is watching it go up the straight towards the Salish Sea there. Um, so this is our statewide video. We have several more that are focused on more regional areas that give, give more detail. Um, but you can see we're not even safe down here in Tacoma. It's coming for us right now. So you can see waves keep coming. They don't stop. Um, we're about three hours into the video. Um, our data goes many, many, many more hours. Um, we kind of kept these videos to about a six hour length, but it's very telling. And um, we're hoping to educate more people in the public. One big difference between this Japanese tsunami and one that could happen here is that Japan was really prepared for a big tsunami and we are really not. So we're hoping to change that. All right, here's my info in case you need it, but thank you. <laughs> 